from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Um, my name is Hong Tamor, uh, reference librarian for um, Southeast Asia Collection in the Asian Division. Um, thank you for joining us today for a lecture on shadow theater in Indonesia. In collaboration with the Embassy of Indonesia, the Asian Division is honored to have two distinguished experts in the field of Balinese shadow theater to talk to us about this ancient form of storytelling through the use of puppets and shadows. Due to time constraints, please hold your questions until the end. Uh, with us today, we have Dr. Andy McGraw, an associate professor of music at the University of Richmond, Virginia. He received his PhD in ethnomusicology at West Wesley, I'm sorry, Wesleyan University in 2005 and has published extensively on traditional and experimental music in Southeast Asia. His performances and collaborations have, uh, have appeared on the Zadik, Sargasso, and Porter labels. He is the author of Radical Traditions, Reimagining Culture in Balinese Contemporary Music which was published in 2013 by Oxford University Press, and co-editor of Performing Indonesia, published in 2016 by the Smithsonian Publications. His current monograph pr project entitled Good Music, Sound Ethics, is an <clears throat> eth ethnography of music as ethical practice in four alternative communities, a monastery, jail, commune, and village. Uh, also joining us is Mr. Gusti Sukdarta, a Balinese shadow master, musician, composer, dancer, and choreographer. At age six, Mr. Sudarta began extensive and continuous study of traditional Balinese performing arts, music, dance, and theater with family members and master performers in the villages of, excuse my glasses, Bana, <laughs> Ubud, Sukarto, Sukawati. He has been a permanent faculty member at the Institute of the Arts in Denpasa since 1991. He is a renowned performer of Balinese traditional forms and is at the forefront of contemporary experimentation. He has performed extensively in Asia, Europe, Australia, and America, conducting three world tours with the Theft of Sita project between 1998 and 2003. He is currently pursuing his PhD at SIS Sukar Surakarta, Indonesia. Uh, please join me to welcome our guests. Thank you. Hi folks, thanks for coming. Um, so this is how this talk is going to go. Um, we're going to demonstrate um, some sh traditional shadow theater techniques, uh, talk about a traditional performance uh, that um, has informed some experimental work that Pat Gusti has been doing. Um, and what we'll do first is I'll give a really brief introduction on Indonesia. Uh, and Bali and shadow theater. Um, and then I'll hand it over to Pat Gusti. Um, he's not completely fluent in English, so the way we put this paper together was yesterday I sat down with him and interviewed him on this topic, wrote up the notes in English, and he will be reading them today. And I'll be running the slides and showing the video and kind of coming back and maybe um, helping pronunciation if and when uh, it needs uh, a little bit of clarification. Um, so 
I'm assuming if you're in the room, you know where the nation of Indonesia is, okay? I, I, don't, I don't need to go very deeply into this, I, I hope, um, other than to, to remind you that uh, it's very large, very complicated nation with a lot of different ethnicities, a lot of different languages, and many, many waves of in-migrations, right? So a lot of religious syncretism, cultural uh, syncretism, um, and in Bali and Java, a really complicated mix of, of Buddhist, Hindu, and uh, Islamic uh, ideas, cultural practices, and, um, and uh, mixture with indigenous animism. Um, that's all I'm going to go with that, okay? We could spend the rest of the talk on it, but it, I get a sense that you, you already know this. Here's a sense of uh, Bali and its regencies. Uh, Pak Gusti is from the village of Adulu in Ganyar, which was the seat of the Balinese uh, kingdom when the, uh, when the uh, military expedition from Majapahit in the 14th century came over to Bali and uh, changed a lot uh, uh, of Balinese culture and introduced new religious and, and cultural practices. Um, so... Pat Gusti and I have been working together since about 2001, yeah. 2002. So he is one of my teachers of uh, the rather specialized music that accompanies the Balinese shadow play. It's called Ginder Wayang. Uh, but we've done a lot of collaborations together over the years. Um, and we were just performing this weekend at the Illuminasia Festival over at the Smithsonian Saturday night and then Sunday morning, and then over at the Kennedy Center Sunday evening. And we'll, we'll show some footage uh, from, from that. Um, I assume also that you know uh, what Wayang are. So can we, can we show? They're the traditional uh, shadow puppets of Indonesia. It's, it's buffalo hide that's been uh, perforated, cut, and then painted. Um, why are they painted when you only see the shadow? Uh, it's, both to help, <laughs> it's both to help remind the puppeteer or the dalang um, of the character traits of the puppets, um, but also because the audience often sits on both sides of the screen and they move around during the performances. Um, and after our talk, you can, you can get a chance to come up and, and, and check them out more closely. Um, so what we thought we would do is actually open up this talk by Pat Gusti doing the traditional kayonan. Uh, the kayon is the tree of life, sometimes called the gunungan in the, in the Javanese tradition, um, and it dances to create the universe of the play. So we thought we would open up with a traditional kayonan performance, and then what's called the alasa room, or the fragrant forest, which is the scene in which the Dalang uh, recites um, poetry in the Kawi language um, that uh, sets the scene and introduces the main uh, characters before Pat Gusti reads his section of the paper. So what we'll do here is um, we'll play. So we have some music. Um, we'll play, if this works. We'll play this scene from the Kennedy Center performance yesterday, so he has some music to accompany the Kayon on here. Oh, error loading media file. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, nice. Yeah. Let's see. Let's try it one more time. There we go. Let me cue it up. Okay. Yeah. I want you to look at him, though, and listen. <laughs> So when you hear that 
knocking. It's him hitting the side of the shadow puppet box, and that wakes the puppets up and invites the gods to descend into them. Could you just hit, hit the button that opens up the entire screen? So it's just like partially out of the seat. Sure. I meant for the entire slide. Yeah. I will, I will. I'm sorry. Look at him now. So there were moments in there where um, I think you could see it um, represents wind, represents water, represents land. And then what he would do is he would sing the scene for Alasa Rum. And he chose some special texts for these performances based on a, a legend called Suta Soma, a story called Suta Soma. Normally, it's a different text that's used, but he took this text uh, from this story. Uh, and the author or the, the scribe that set this version of Sutta Soma has been informing Pat Gustig's experimental work. So we wanted to start from there so you have a sense of the kind of evolution from the traditional uh, text to the experim experimental work that we'll show later at the end. And I'll slide through the translations of the Kawi, the liturgical Javanese that he's going to sing. That would be the next section of the shadow play. <laughs> Chattering 
Pintan gati kunangi kang kalu, miji. Oh, soang yang sunyan taruka di gelap su merasakan usup pengerang duning poraja menalu. Kumutori kang pertiwi talu, wapuah boyu tejo akasu wintang terangganu. Muangi kuang suri ojo Aduh Kumut Om repri Soah kala soah inganing Soah ngapar mana Soas tu pari purna Tan kena kacau kan ngila ila muangi Kang sot sot sapa Pada wacana ni rebetor Hanti om Tu mualaning semua aku ngulur neri poh dani riang. Mie, oh, soang yang ringit dia tu mula cari. Wet duduk di neri soang yang para mau kawin guni wekan yang neri soang yang guru aku. Ma pan wo sampun jangkep ikan nang bodoh cari teri pangi ke dalam putan tular. Mijen, sang yang kawi suara murti mengal punang tak dua cari tu, cari tanah. Hari ke kanan ini situ semua raja putra sini pura yang sedang agen rasa lawan cerakan ini rumah keruang siki, semua kan itu kalah ni repot semangke. Thank you. Suta Soma, I am going to talk today about the story of Suta Soma and the priest and scribe Mputan Tular who spread the story through his poetry. Tantular lived during the 14th century in the central Javanese kingdom of Majapahit. Suta Soma is believed to be the grandson of Jana Majaya, the last king mentioned in the Hindu Mahabharata epic. The story combines elements of Hinduism and Buddhism, and Sutta Soma himself is thought to be the Bodhisattva of the Vairochana, the supreme Buddha in the Mahayana tradition. Today the story is well known in Bali, especially in the village of Budakling, with its history of Buddhist priests. And among the flowers of the Kejawen religion in Central Java, a syncretic religion that combines Hindu, Buddhist, and Muslim elements. For many Balinese, the story embodies Agamo Bali, or Balinese religion, as distinct from Indian Hinduism because it combines many different beliefs and promotes religious pluralism. The story of Stasoma begin with Purusada, an honorable king who enjoys hunting a little too much. 
Iblis sepuluh sada okay. Puro sada enjoyed eating the animal he hunted in one day one of his assistants accidentally cut his finger while cooking the animal he caught bleeding into the food Purusada found this meal the most the most delicious and it awoke in him an animal nature that grew ferocious ferociously ferocious <laughs> okay so the assistant cut his own finger not Purusada's <laughs> fingers he became addicted to to the taste of human flesh and began to become a cruel ruler imposing corporal punishment to feed his habit. Slowly, he became a raksasa, an ogre. One day, Purusada injured himself and the wound would not heal. So he asked for help from Sang Yang Kala, the god of time and death. Kala demanded to the corpses of a hundred kings in sacrifice and so Purusada began to wage war all across the country in the form of the elephant-headed ogre Gajah Wakra. Gajah Wakra like that. Waduh! <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, Kala demanded Sutasoma, the king of the Hastinapura kingdom, as a sacrifice as well. Sutasoma, if you know, it's very handsome. Okay, like this. Sutasoma. Wala nira rengundat udah very handsome and refined character. <laughs> Suta Soma's brother-in-law Dasabau. Okay, that's another Dasabau. This character Dasabau. First faced Purusada in battle. Dasabau was given a boon by Lord Brahma and Prasada was given a boon by Lord Ludra, a manifestation of Shiva. Because they were both very powerful, they were destroyed, destroyed, destroyed the environment. It looked like a nuclear was the land. Eventually, Prasada defeated Dasabau. When Stasoma came out of the court to face Prasada, all of the flowers began to bloom again, the aura of the Buddha brought the land back to life. When Purusada saw this, he suddenly became aware of what he had become and asked, why have I done this? Why have I become a Raksasa? Purusada begged Sutta Soma for forgiveness and asked to become his disciple. But Sutta Soma first offered himself as a sacrifice to Sang Yang Kalo, who became an enormous dragon in order to try and swallow, he, swallow him. It's a Kala, already transformed to be the giant dragon. <laughs> Just as he swallowed Stasoma's feet, Sanyangkala realized that time cannot eat Stasoma because as the Buddha, he transcends time itself. And so like Purusada, Sanyangkala begged for forgiveness and asked to become his disciple. The story of Stasoma includes a very important poem called the Wasanta Tilaka, structured 14 syllable kekawin verse. 
Rwane ke datu winu suara buddha wiswa This is a very creative translation here. It's said that there are two truths, one known as Buddha and one as Shiva. Bine kira kore ngapan kena parwunusun. They may appear different, but in fact, spiritual truth cannot be split in two. Mwangkang jina atwa kelawan siwata atwa tungal. Truly the essence of Buddhism and Shivaism are one, the deepest truth. Bineka tungal ika tan kana dharma mangrwa. This difference is only apparent. In diversity, there is oneness, an essence that cannot be divided because it encompasses everything. In Bali, this poem is often sung during the Musim Semi, the fourth month. It evokes a feeling of a beautiful blooming spring season. Now, this idea of religious pluralism, flowering of an essential oneness has, in my opinion, a very strong moral ethic, and it relates to Mpu Tantular's political and historical context. Mpu Tantular context. Tantular lived outside the court during the rule of Hayam Uruk, whose Prime Minister Gajah Mada wanted to expand the Majapahit Empire through military expedition. Mpu Tantular didn't agree with this militaristic approach. He thought that Majapahit could expand through hearts and minds, through diplomacy rather than force. He believed force would only lead to problem, problems and temporary controls. And this is exactly what happened in Gajah Mada's military expedition in Bali and in Sunda, West Java. Mbu Tantular thought that religious tolerance and pluralism was an essential essential part of diplomacy. He followed the Buddhist tradition but was open to the Shivaite teachings. Hayam Uruk himself was Hindu while Gajah Mada was Buddhist with some Chinese ancestry. The eventual collapse of the Majapahit Empire in the 15th century was partly due to religious tension between the Hindu rulers Vijaya and his Muslim son Raden Patta. Indonesia independence. Sukarno, Indonesia first president, incorporated many concepts from the Sutasoma story in developing the nation's founding philosophy. This is clearly seen in the five principles, the Pancasila, first expressed by Sukarno in 1945. One ketuhanan yang Maha Esa, believe in one God, kemanusiaan yang adil dan beradab, just and civilized humanity, persatuan Indonesia, a unified Indonesia, kerakyatan yang dipimpin oleh hikmat kebijaksanaan dalam permusyawaratan perwakilan, demokrasi, and keadilan sosial bagi seluruh rakyat Indonesia, social justice. These five principles are expressed under the national motto of Bineka Tungal Ika, United in Diversity. The relationship between the spirituality and bravery expressed in Sutasoma is symbolized in the Indonesian flag, the white symbolizing a basis of spirituality that informs a brave disposition, symbolized by red. If you have a spiritual foundation, you can avoid the need for violence. Bravery without spiritual wisdom creates confusion. Religious Pluralism. Adopting the principles of religious tolerance and pluralism from Stasamoa was a strategic move for Sukarno, who was attempting to unite the inhabitants of 7,000 islands, representing hundreds of ethnicities, language, and culture in a single new nation. But a spirit of syncretic religious and philosophical tolerance was already present in many of this culture. My father who lived from 1917 and 2004 was a traditional healer, village priest, 
and a lover uh, of literature. In his personal library, he had many traditional Balinese Hindu and Buddhist palm leaves manuscripts, Christian texts, theosophical texts, Islamic texts, including the Javanese Vedatama, written by Mangku Nogara IV, and writings by Krishnamurti. His attitude wasn't dogmatic or fanatical. If it thought a text or tradition includes valuable teachings, he would adopt them. He would say, Ise nel wong. Which we didn't translate. That means it's got great stuff in it. <laughs> <laughs> I do not think he was unusual for his generation. I know of many elder Balinese who read a similar combination of texts from several religious traditions. In fact, in Bali, there is a strong tradition of religious pluralism and connect connection between Hindu and Muslim communities. For instance, in the village of Kramas. You want to say? Yeah, uh, there's a good example that Pak Gusti just found, and he posted it on Facebook. So we'll see if we can. Uh, yes, this was just posted a couple days ago. Um, and you'll see the Muslim performer in the in the kopia, in the Balinese Hindu temple performing. And oh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but here's a, here's a short example. There is an Islamic neighborhood that participates in the temple ceremony of their Hindu neighbors. The Muslims often perform their rodak from drums in the Hindu temple ceremonies. And the, Hindu, and the Hindus bring offering to the Islamic community on their holidays, being careful to avoid pork. Similar interaction also occur in Java, in the eastern Javanese city of Banyuwangi. The Muslims prepare drinks and replacement for the Hindus during their temple procession. Contemporary context. While I believe Pancasila is a profound philosophical basis for the nation, it began to become hardened and brittle during Swarto presidency and the so-called Order Baru, 1965 and 1998. During this time, Pancasila became enforced dogma in the school system, and Pancasila's exam became required for all civil servants. Important tular exorcism against militarized dem diplomacy also seemed to be forgotten. This was seen the files military control of East Timor, which eventually gained independence from Indonesia in 1999 after considerable violence. Following the fall of Suharto in 1998, there has been an increasing radicalism in politics and religion, and it, it is in this context, and I have written to the story of Stasoma and the life of Mpu Tantular for inspiration for my creative work. While Sutasoma was performed within traditional wayang kulit, it fell out of favor in the early 1980. It was considered too happy today. For heavy. Heavy. <laughs> Popular shadow puppeteers in Bali use simple narratives with today, today yeah. with extensive comic and fight scene. I think this the same. Traditional wayang performance provides its audience with entertainment and some serious food for thoughts, philosophy for them to take home with them and think of her. As my father used to say, apa man bekal apa mulih? What is it you can take home? You cannot take home 
a puppeteer, fancy techniques, or beautiful voice, but you can take home his philosophical lesson. In wayang stories like Sosoma o Chandra Berawa, in which there is debate about the merit, merits and commonalities of different religious teaching, we learn how to think on our own to make our own personal relationship of to spirituality. But in Indonesian today, religion is often conflated with ethnicity and party seeking political power. There is also an increasing fundamentalist tendency to establish so-called pure religious teachings, either in Arabic Islam or in Indian Hinduism, losing fight of the unique Indonesian adaptation of those traditions. I worry that the orthodox religious political parties are eroding the unique philosophical basis of the nation. They have gotten the kingdoms like Majapahit well, because religion was manipulated, manipulated in seeking power and wealth. The closer of to power you get, the more factional and dogmatic conversation about religion become, as in Jakarta today. Kidung Mbutan Dular. This is the situation that inspired my experimental theater work, Kidung Mbutan Dular, which I originally composed for many for my master researcher with studying at the Indonesia Institute of the Arts in Solo, Java, 2008. I have seen, revised, and performed the work several times. My idea was to imagine Tantula's work and the condition that inspired him to set the story of Stasoma. My arrangement includes elements of Balinese and Javanese, Hindu, Buddhist, and Islamic music and instruments. I use Balinese gamelan, Javanese gamelan, and Derbana frame drum used by Muslim communities in Bali. I also use the beduk, the log drum that Indonesian Muslim use for the call to prayer in the mosque. Some of my thesis is I saw critiqued this, critic this approach and recommended that I erase the Muslim aspect of the music, but I think they misses the point. Audience enthousi enthusiastically accepted these innovations. The vocal overture I use is in Sanskrit, a setting of poetry from the Sankaracharya, but using Muslim instruments from Indonesia and the vocal style influenced by Pakistani Supi Muslim Kawali music. Give me a minute while I try to find this. The piece combines experimental wayang, theater, and mask dancing. The wayang was performed using two screen and spiral puppeteers, and new wayang were created for the performance, including a wayang of Achintia Osang Yang Widiwasel as the source of the flowering plurality of world, world religion. Uh, so yeah, there was an innovative, obviously this is, Innovative. There are several screens. There are dancers, but there are also new puppets that were made. And so, uh, this puppet includes an image of Sanghyang Widiwasa, the, the ultimate deity. But you'll notice the symbols around it. 
mundur apa maju? Masih lah. Ini? Yang mana ini? Mundur. Ah, ini dah. Ah, sekarang. He has many complaints about the videography. <laughs> Near the end of the performance, Mpu Tantular purifies himself by practicing yoga. Once purified, he is purified. He is visited by the character Smar Utwalen in Bali, a court jester who is actually a wise god, an incarnation of Siwa who helps to guide humans toward the Dharma. Utwalen helps Mpu Tantular compose and arrange the story of Stasoma to help deliver. Deliver, deliver the nation. Yeah, deliver the nation from disaster. And this will be the last example. Uh, if I need to find it here. Then we can open it up for questions. It doesn't preview. Okay, bear with me for a minute. Sebelum ini. Setelah ini. Setelah ini. Setelah ini. And that's your niece? Yeah. Setelah ini, setelah tari, setelah tari masih maju lagi. Terakhir, setelah ini. Okay, now, yeah. file line. Next, okay, nah. let's see if it's in this one. It divided up the files strangely when we loaded it on a PC. Nah. Okay, so here is... Here is Samar, or er, Twilin yeah. in Bali. The Javanese version is called Samar. Who's, who appears to be a court jester, just kind of a funky guy. Not very uh, uh, refined, but in fact he's an incarnation of uh, Shiva to help kind of from below guide people to the proper dharma. And he appears in the, in the show to help uh, Imputantalar set yeah. and express Sutta Soma. So now there's a kind of theatrical transition in which Gusti appears now as Samar, but in the mask dance version, who then uh, has, uh, has the interaction with Tantula, now represented as a shadow.
And this music, we're not discussing this today, but this music is quite avant-garde in a Balinese ear as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll end it there. Um, thank you very much, and if you have questions for Pat Kusti. I have a question. Um, so Bali is this tiny island in a, in a Muslim nation of, of seven, that has 17,000 islands and is pretty much the largest Muslim country in the world, or maybe the second largest. And since the 1990s, we have these tensions, these religious tensions globally. Um, and you only have to think of the Rohingya in, in Myanmar right now. So I'm wondering, Bali has this unique fusion of Hinduism, Buddhism, and uh, what's the other one? Islam, Islam, of course. And Islam is the dominant religion, it's sort of Muslim. Bali is this tiny island surrounded by this huge Muslim country. So to what extent are your wonderful traditions are threatened by the current political events? To what extent are there tensions within Indonesia that threaten the continuation of your tradition? <laughs> Oh, tidak ada masa jangan doain mas supaya tidak ada no, no. it's not this yeah. feeling of threat yeah. um, not, not yet yeah. no. well I mean to, no. I'll just add one thing I've, I've never really been able to wrap my head around the description of Indonesia as which you often hear is the world's largest or most populous Muslim nation so much is left out of that description. It's kind of like saying uh, America is the most Americans of any country <laughs> in the world. Um, it's, there are many different kinds of Islam in Indonesia, and a lot of it, especially in Central Java, is very syncretic. I mean, obviously, it's weird for me to talk about this when you guys are sitting in the audience. But um, so it's, it's, it's a very localized, form of Hinduism, I've been in mosques in central Java that have painted around the interior the story of the Ramayana. Yeah. Uh, the Dalang, uh, the shadow puppeteers in central Java, most of the Muslims they use are Hindu. And most of their audience is Muslim. So it's, it's, it's a very complicated scene and a lot of the, even though there, there, there are problems I think of terminology in Bali, uh, there are many Balinese with names like Made, which is a right. techonymy, it's a form of birth order naming in Bali, but they'll have a name like Made Mohammed. Um, yeah. Because they're Islamic and maybe they have some Sasak or Lombok ancestry, right. but they've been there for hundreds and hundreds of years. And they have these long standing, pretty positive relationships with, the, with their neighbors of, of different faiths. So, I think there was a sense of threat after the bombing in 2002. Right. In Bali. In Bali. Bali. Because it was a fundamental. It was in Denpasar, right? It was in, right. yeah, in Kuta, yeah, mm -hmm. close by. But nothing. Yeah. I was there at the time and nothing, there weren't, uh, there wasn't violence against Muslims. Right. That I saw. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of focus on the same line because. The dominant religion and primary Indonesia, Malaysia, they are more Islamic than any other religion. But by looking at those puppets or you call images, it is more Hindu cultural influence because if you see the Sahara, Diwali, all those Indian festivals, that's where they have those kind of puppets and they show it and uh, the way they are dressed and everything. It looks more like to me. Uh, Hindu influence than Islam influence. I think they, uh, uh, I saw straight of India, I feel it is more Hindu influence, Indian influence than it has to do with Islam. Uh, though 
uh, I know, I can read Javi, I see all the manuscripts which are in Asian selection, and they are the, written in Javi language. And they start with verse like, as many other Islami, Bismillah Rahmani Rahim, and all those have quotations from Quran, but Maybe that's uh, what it is. This is has been influenced by uh, Hinduism or Buddhism. Isn't Hinduism pretty unique to Indonesia, just focusing on Bali? I mean, it's concentrated in Bali. Well, it was, it was multiple waves, right? Yeah. And uh, it was never, never through. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of historical evidence for kind of strong arm proselytism, proselytizing um, before the Dutch arrived as a colonial power. But I mean, since probably fifth century, there's been uh, Hindu influence. Of course, right, we get all these issues with naming and colonial naming of religious practices. But you know, there's also quite an Austronesian tradition throughout that area. So this summer, I was sitting in a village uh, called Tanganan, which is an uh, Aga village, or sometimes incorrectly described as pre-Hindu villages in right. Bali. Uh, but it's more around, um, what would you call it, certain sects. So that village is an Indra sect. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's, they, and they identify, particularly with Indra, but they have a lot of what appear to be Austronesian or even kind of, you see kind of Polynesian or Hawaiian type cultural practices there, and megaliths and these kinds of temples. And, and I think it partly had to do with the Dutch coming from that direction and that conditioned their view of a place like Bali. Had they come from Hawaii first, they might have seen a lot more Austronesian or Polynesian practice in, in a lot of this. But it's very, it's very syncretic, it's very mixed, and I think what Pat Gusti is responding like, with a critical eye against is this eye looking out. Uh, for so-called pure versions through which to correct or improve uh, what has proven over time to be a, a, a quite resilient form of localized religious practice in Bali. Am I putting words in your mouth? Or <laughs> mm -mm. Yeah, Alyssa. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, this was, was wonderful. So um, this is really awe-inspiring in the way that the Panchasila ideals are really elevated through the interfaith diversity um, mixture that, that uh, this is showing. And in some ways, it's so um, impressive because the traditions are so strong. So that in the, in the, um, in one sense, the, the Wayan is always evolving and traditions are always evolving and melting with one another. But in, in another way, you, you kind of need some traditional form in order for something like this to be kind of so well. So I wonder if you can talk about the um, experimental uh, why on as a separate genre versus kind of the, the slow evolution of, uh, of, pr of practices. Do you, uh, <laughs> yeah. Apa wayang kecemerlangan apa memang evolusi apa memang apa jenis lain kalau dibanding dengan wayang tradisi yang disebut the new creation of the wayang the contemporary wayang in Bali today the, this is the basic the roots from the our tradition the Balinese shared puppet tradition performance like that and we uh, we bring for the co contemporary context with the new ideal and new element and new instrument also <coughs> like that. And we compose uh, to be the new, uh, say the puppet, uh, performance the new, uh, uh, the contextual for the contemporary uh, so today. Has every generation thought that they, has every generation thought along those lines or is this, can you define this as kind of a new, a new thing that's happening? The last minute. If I, if I, yeah. apa ini lebih eksperimental lagi? Apa ini tetap evolusi dari generasi sebelumnya? Setiap generasi punya hak untuk ah. apa? Bikin kreasi baru. Ah, uh, we can say like that. In the uh, pseudo puppet tradition, they have uh, 
also like uh, uh, nucleates, nucleation uh, in the context of frame tradition. But uh, the other side is the new experimental uh, creation like that. For, for example, when I call collaboration with the, my friend in Java also, and Australia, the, doing the new performance, uh, the basic from the, say, the puppet theater, this is very good. Uh, the new element like the video, uh, video, uh, video graphics, like that, uh, film, and like that, and uh, many things of uh, uh, new technology, it's okay. But the, I think the most important is how, how I keep the essence of the my tradition and I bring to the uh, contemporary context the most important uh, the essence of tradition I think. Yeah, we've been talking on the drive up here there's, there's a, a major new shadow puppet collection from Germany that's just been do donated to Yale and a friend of, I, of ours is up there going through it and posting all these pictures and there was this picture of how they put the, the, the box together there was like a spring in there. I mean, it's from the looked like it was from the 30s or 40s. And there was a spring in there, and I thought, what is this? Like, what? I how they were putting it all together. And he was explaining, oh, the way we hit the box now, and the way we put it all together, that just emerged 40 years ago. And there are all these new kind of percussive techniques. And for me, I mean, this is part of my experience as an American. Everything is tradition and ancient <laughs> and wonderful and beautiful and. and and I'm constantly having this like, oh, that's brand new. That's okay. <laughs> and reminding myself, that's okay. Like, that's still totally valid. Um, I think part of the difference here is that, you know, new technology is available. You know, projection. And they're, new, they're available everywhere. And at this point, they're available everywhere more or less at the same time. So you get experiments in California and Australia and Bali with shadows and projections and graphics at like almost the same time. Even though it's about to explode. Yeah. <laughs> In spite of the technology and everything, he wasn't afraid to go up because he wanted to do his own thing according to his religion. You know, so that's how I see it. I don't know whether I'm correct or not. <laughs> but what what I'm always fascinated with is this yeah, there's a lot of Orthopraxy. I mean, there's a lot of just doing 
of the religions. The making of the offerings and the praying, the temple ceremonies, very exhausting. Uh, and yet, I'm always meeting people that, my cab driver on the way to the airport after research this summer was from this traditional village where I was sitting, but he was really getting into this new Buddhist uh, text that was coming out, uh, being published in China, and was kind of being introduced into Indonesia, and he wanted to ask me about, uh, have I ever been to a charismatic Christian service, and what's <laughs> that like? I mean, there, there's this, my experience as an American is you're kind of totally assimilated and there's not a lot of critical thought, or you reject it all and you're completely idiosyncratic, and you don't even have a community. Uh, and to find people that are part of very kind of structured religious communities and yet have a real critical eye and they're saying, it's almost like they're at a buffet, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, just like, I'll take a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And maybe 10 years later, I'm gonna be a different person and I would have learned other things. And, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll evolve as a spiritual being even though I'm still doing these things within a particular community. And for me, as an American, that's what's so uh, unique and different that I kind of have this hang, up, this hang up and jealousy of that. If we had that on a global level, we would be in a different shape. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Great, let's give Pat Gusti a yeah. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.